Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Idahoan Show. So, as you're probably aware if you've been following this channel long enough, uh, a while ago I realized that of all the books in the Bible, the one that I was probably the least familiar with in terms of its content was the book of Psalms. And so, to remedy that deficiency in my knowledge, I started going through the book of Psalms and writing a Psalter, you know, paraphrasing each of the Psalms to make it more singable in English, and thereby familiarizing myself with the content of the book of Psalms. And as I've been doing this, I've noticed that an overwhelmingly common theme in the book of Psalms is deliverance from one's enemies. It seems like it comes up in just about every psalm, uh, whether the psalmist is, uh, is praying that God would destroy his enemies, uh, whether he's sort of complaining to God about how his enemies are persecuting him, uh, or whether he's thanking God for giving him victory over his enemies. Uh, you know, it, it seems like it comes up in almost every psalm, whether it's, uh, whether it's just a line or two thrown in there somewhere, or whether it's the focus of the entire psalm, as it sometimes is. Now, for myself, and I think for most Christians in typical evangelical churches, this theme is a little bit shocking, because we're used to churches teaching us to make peace with our enemies rather than seeking their destruction. And that theme or that teaching is not without biblical basis. I mean, Christ told us to love our enemies. The apostles told us, you know, insofar it is possible, live peaceably with all men. So uh, how that really begs the question of how we should interpret this theme from the Psalms uh, and apply it as modern-day Christians. And as I've been pondering this issue, I've come up with three different answers that kind of hinge on the question of, well, who are my enemies? First off, I don't think we can or should totally rule out a literal interpretation. Uh, when the psalmist writes about his enemies, in general, he seems to be referring to literal people. So, if we take a step back from our Christian culture shock at this concept, uh, the principle here is if you have an enemy, if somebody's out to get you or you have a problem with somebody, pray about it. And also bear in mind that many of the Psalms were written by King David, who's a head of state. Uh, you know, he's involved in national and international affairs and military conflicts and so forth. So, uh, for one, you know, I think it is appropriate to pray that justice would be done in national and international affairs and military conflicts and so forth. Uh, and then, even at the personal level, it's appropriate to pray that God would protect you from people who would seek to harm you wrongfully, uh, and that justice would be done. Because we know that God is a just God. He's not going to answer your prayers in a way that would be unjust, and his justice is always tempered with mercy. So, uh, first off, in the literal sense, the application is that it's appropriate to pray for justice. The second possibility is to interpret the enemies of the Psalms a little bit more symbolically or metaphorically. I mean, when I ask, who are my enemies, I don't think I have any in the sense that King David did. Uh, certainly there are uh, political figures and other people out there that I don't think have my best interests at heart, you know, people who could do me harm by pushing agendas that are contrary to my best interests, but I don't think any of them are out to get me in the way that certain people were gunning for King David at various times. Uh, so when I think of, you know, who are my enemies, I wouldn't be thinking so much of people as 
impersonal movements or factors or forces. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe you're a farmer and your crops are failing because of drought. And so your enemy right now is the drought. Or, you know, maybe you're struggling financially and so your biggest enemy right now is poverty. Uh, you know, so if we interpret the concept of enemies a little more symbolically, a little more generically as sort of anything that is detrimental to you or that's holding you back, then as we read these psalms where the psalmist is praying for deliverance or praying for the strength, the ability to crush his enemies, uh, you know, that for us, that could mean, you know, praying that a certain immoral and ill-conceived political movement would fail in its objectives or praying for an end to a drought or praying for the ability to conquer poverty in your life by getting a better job or finding a better way to budget or whatever the case may be. Uh, you know, similarly, you could pray that God would deliver you from, uh, from fear or from alcoholism or from anything that is holding you back or is detrimental to you. And, you know, when you take an impersonal force or factor that's detrimental to you and you metaphorically personify it as an enemy to be conquered, that arguably makes the problem into more of a, a personal conflict that, that might motivate you to pray about it more fervently and work on the problem more diligently. So, yeah, I think there could be some value in the second approach, both physically and spiritually. And then the third possibility is to interpret the enemies of the Psalms as spiritual enemies. Uh, we know that there were a lot of physical things done in the Old Testament as symbols that would point to spiritual things or spiritual truths that would be revealed in the New Testament. Um, so I think this is a, a valid principle to apply as we're looking at the Psalms in the Old Testament. Um, and the way that that would work out, if I can summarize for you in a nutshell all the sermons I've heard on the subject of spiritual warfare, the teaching is basically that we have three standard spiritual enemies, usually uh, referred to as the world, the flesh, and the devil, although it might be more precise to refer to them as worldly influences, fleshly lusts, and fallen angels. Of the three, the fallen angels are by far the easiest to deal with because you know, Christ gave his disciples power to rebuke unclean spirits, fallen angels, etc. Uh, you know, we're told that if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. So if you're actually being tempted to sin by the devil or his henchmen, all you have to do is offer some resistance in the name of Christ and that temptation will be removed. You know, the devil will have to flee from you. Now, if you're being tempted by the world rather than the devil, then you're dealing with fallen people rather than fallen angels. Uh, worldly people can create all kinds of opportunities and temptations to sin. And again, because we're talking about spiritual enemies here, it's not the people themselves that are your enemies, per se. It's the temptations that they create. And so, in this case, it's your turn to flee. Uh, you know, as it is written, flee from worldly lusts. Uh, so, basically, the approach is don't put yourself in situations where you're going to face a lot of pressure to sin or to do things that would be morally inappropriate. Uh, you know, try to avoid those situations or get yourself out of those situations when you find yourself in them. So, you know, don't hang out at brothels, 
don't get involved with business partners who are into doing shady deals, that kind of thing. And then the third spiritual enemy, the flesh, refers to your own innate predilection towards sin, uh, which, as we know, is common to all the descendants of Adam. And this is by far the most difficult of the three spiritual enemies to defeat because uh, it's part of you. You know, it can't flee from you, you can't flee from it, so the only option that remains is a fight to the death. You know, literally, you'll be fighting your own sin nature as long as you live on this earth. Uh, and, and so this is where we get into the biblical teachings on crucifying the flesh or putting it to death. Uh, you know, if, if you think of the mechanics of crucifixion, it's not so much a lethal injury in and of itself as it's a very painful way of restraining someone and then hanging them out in the weather until they die of dehydration and exposure. And so crucifying the flesh in the biblical sense basically means restraining your sin nature until it dies. You know, practicing self-restraint as long as you live, no matter how difficult or painful that might be. And so in this lifelong battle, uh, our own innate lusts would definitely be an enemy that we could think of and apply the Psalms to as we're reading and praying with the psalmist that God would enable us to crush our enemies. Anyway, uh, that's what I've been thinking on this subject of conquering enemies that comes up so frequently in the psalms. Uh, hopefully this will make the psalms more applicable to you, or at least uh, help you to apply those portions that are maybe less churchy, less politically correct, whether in the, the scriptures themselves or in my paraphrases of the psalms, because I've tried to faithfully paraphrase the original intent. I don't feel that it's my place to go censoring scripture. Um, but anyway, uh, that's all I wanted to say. So till next time, thank you for watching The Idahoan Show.